run through the techniques used in these mittens. They're called Twilight Mittens from Mountain Meadow Wool, and they're a fair aisle design, which means there are two, two strands of yarn used, one darker and one lighter, and that makes them extra thick and warm, and they feel great, very warm, 100% wool. <clears throat> and these come in a kit. There are different colors to choose from. In the next section, I'll show you how the different color kits knit up so you can have a look to help you make a decision. And in the kit, in the kit, you get your yarn. And this happens to be the colors Fire and Pumpkin. You get your pattern. And you also get Knitter's Pride Zing 12 inch circulars. And <clears throat> it's funny because I've used nine inch circulars a million different times uh, for socks, you know, other, mostly just socks, I guess, <laughs> maybe mittens too. And I've used 16 inch circulars for hats. Never really thought about 12 inch circulars before, but they are perfect for fair aisle mittens. Mainly because that extra bit of cord, because you could knit mittens on nine inch circulars, no problem, but that extra bit of cord helps keep the stitches uh, spread apart just enough so that the floats on the back of your work don't get bunched up and you end up with beautiful tension on your mittens. So very smart. If you would like to get your kit to follow along, just click the little I in the upper right hand corner. And I will also put a link in the video description field below to my website where I'll have links to everything because if you're on your cell phone, you might not see that little I in the upper right hand corner. And these are from Mountain Meadow Wool, and the yarn is 100% Mountain Merino, which they describe as a bouncy yarn with rustic appeal. I love it. <laughs> and I want to thank Mountain Meadow Wool not only for bringing us the this tutorial, but also uh, they scheduled this back when I was still shooting at my studio before social distancing guidelines, and so I talked with them that we're still going to be putting out a video every week, but things are going to look different since I'm shooting here at my home now. My producer is still editing <clears throat> and uploading the videos to YouTube and everything, but I'm running both sides <laughs> of the camera right now, which is still new to me and more challenging than I expected it to be. But Mountain Meadow Wool, they were still on board. They just wanted everyone to be safe and uh, obey the social distancing guidelines and many thanks to them for that. I'm very happy to be working with them. Anyway, so that is the intro to these. Oh no, I guess I have one more thing to say. I would put these at an intermediate pattern. Not a great brand new beginner pattern because of the, mostly because of the fair aisle. The mittens themselves are really pretty easy. The pattern itself is really pretty simple. But there's you know a lot going on with the fair aisle, even though it's a simple design. If you want some ideas for maybe patterns to start with, to work your way up to these, I will put that on my website as well if you follow the link wherever you're going to follow it. I'll put a couple patterns in there that can kind of ease you into a fair aisle mitten pattern like this. Okay, next up we are going to get started with the cast on. Okay, if you've followed through to the links and you've taken a look at the different kits, I'm gonna show you the different kit colors. We're gonna get started with the cast on. In this section, we're also going to talk about reading charts and uh, carrying fair aisle floats. And I have my whole list here. I'll make sure you, <laughs> I'll make sure we cover all of it. Let's take a look. Okay, first let's take a look at the finished mitts. They are right left mittens. They're different on the inside, the palm side than the outside. We just have an alternating stitch here on the inside, very easy to work and then the snowflake pattern on the outside, and the cuffs have this branch pattern. It's also pretty fun to work. And the design is pretty simple. They are just kind of rectangles with this shaping on top and a thumb sticking out. <laughs> and you'll see when we look at the chart that it is pretty simple. So this color combination is teal and glacier. And this sample, I have natural and pine cone. And I'll tell you, this initially I was thinking that I was going to work the the cream color as uh, as the background and I worked that up just a tiny little bit here and I decided that I wanted the dark as the background not that there's anything wrong with this but I think I ended up liking this better 
And then in this sample, it is salmon and quartz. And that knits up very pretty. And I think I keep messing up where my hands need to go. <laughs> Again, I'm working both sides of the camera here. I'm going to have to keep watching to make sure that I keep the things on camera. Okay, thank you for being patient with me here. Okay, the first thing that we'll look at is the chart, the whole chart and then a the little bit of the chart that I have. This is the whole chart. And there's no thumb in here because that's in a separate chart, but it's a pretty short little chart. The whole chart here, and I've actually blown up part of the chart so we can take a close look at it. And it's separated into two halves. The, um, the pattern has you mark, put a marker in between the palm side and the back of the mitten. And um, what else was I going to say about that? I can't remember now, but this is a little bit of the chart that we're going to work. <laughs> I'm losing it because I can't concentrate on watching the camera and watching my knitting. Okay, I'm just going to forget about the camera. I'm going to forget about the camera and then uh, just work on this. So because this is knit in the round, this is typical for all the charts you're going to work, you're always going to read from right to left, every single row, right to left, right to left, right to left. When you knit a flat piece, a lot of times, you'll read the right side rows from right to left and the wrong side rows from left to right. But because these are knit in the round on our 12 inch circulars, we're always going to be reading from right to left. And in this, it's mostly just a color pattern. The dots are the other color. The, the, the empty squares are the background color. I guess we don't call it the other color. We call it the contrasting color. The dots are the contrasting color. And in this part, I guess we do have some decreases. I'll show you those. These little dashes, they don't actually appear in the key, but those are purl stitches. Just so you know, it makes a nice little nice little cuff on the mittens so that they don't curl up, right? If they, it does curl up a little bit, but the purl row stops it. And that's a nice little cuff at the bottom. And we have a couple of decreases. We have a couple of knit two togethers here and here, and then we have more at the top of the mitt. The, this de these two decreases here really just get you from the stitch count of the branch pattern into the snowflake pattern. It's just a little adjustment to get us from one to the other. So let's take a look at the cast on because since these are Fair Isle mittens and we have what they are, what are called floats on the back of the work, what you see here in these cream colored lines, those are the color that we're not using. And we need that color that we're not using to be kind of loose on the back of the work because if it's tight, it will cause bunching on the front of the work. So the 12 inch circulars keep the stitches spaced out a little bit so that that works out well. Um, but I want to talk about the cast on ropes. I know people are going to ask. So here I have most of the stitches cast on and I'm using a long tail cast on and I'll give you a link to this cast on if you're not familiar with it. And when I'm working this, I'm keeping it kind of loose. I'm keeping it consistent so that I have a nice edge here, but I'm not I'm not pulling this yarn super tight after each one I work, right? I'm pulling it and then kind of just giving it a little bit of ease. Not too tight. And the reason for that is that we do want these stitches to be able to reach around, to reach around the 12 inch circulars. And your cast on should reach around the 12 inch circulars. If it doesn't, try casting on a little bit looser um, you could pull the extra cord out, I suppose, like doing some magic loop for the first couple of rounds until it loosens up. Something like, I'm not even sure that's actually very convenient with these short circulars. I think you'll run into more problems with that. So try, just get, get the cast on loose enough so that you can get it around the circular needles. And then you're going to, excuse my reach there, place a marker and knit one round. And of course, when we're joining in the round, we wanna make sure that nothing is twisted. I actually kind of stretched out those stitches there when I was <laughs> checking out the magic loop. Um, I'm just about to lose a stitch here. I caught it. When I join in the round, I just start knitting. 
and the cast on, the row after the cast on, is going to be a bit snug around the needles even if you kept your stitches loose in the cast on. Okay. But you just keep scooting things around. And if you hear clicking, that's because dogs just went outside. Okay, so that's the cast on. Just be patient with it. After you get done with the cast on row, things loosen up a little bit and it's not so hard. Okay, the next thing um, we will talk about is, um, we talked about reading the chart. Working Fair Isle. And I'm afraid my stuff is a little bit tangled. I mean, it happens when you're working Fair Isle that you end up with some tangled yarns just because you have multiple yarns happening. But when you have multiple samples of multiple yarns, <laughs> it gets even worse. So actually, you know, there's one more thing I want to talk about before we, we get into that. Because on this sample, this sample and this sample are a little bit different. And I just want you to focus on this section right here. If you look carefully, this section, the darker pink is kind of tucked behind the lighter pink. And in this one, the darker pink is kind of more prominent. That's called yarn dominance. And it makes a difference when you're working Fair Isle, which yarn you hold above the other color. And I say above because people think about it in different ways. Which color is, is over the other color? The color that's held below the other color, and I'll demonstrate this when my, we actually start working the Fair Isle, is going to have more prominence in the work. And it doesn't matter which one you hold, um, which way you hold it, uh, it just matters that you're consistent. So in this one, I've held the darker pink below the lighter pink, and the darker pink is more prominent. This one, I held the lighter pink below, and so the lighter pink is more prominent. When I posted this on Facebook, people said, I don't even see a difference. I don't know what you're talking about. There is a difference, and you will see it if you're, if you're inconsistent with, um, with how you hold the yarn. So that's something to keep in mind. So this one, I'm holding the darker pink above the other color, and that means that this one, the darker pink is always here, and the lighter pink is always here as I'm carrying the work across. Okay, let's get back to the chart. In this piece, I've worked the purl row, the alternating stitch colors, another purl row, and I've worked one um, section of the branches and three knit rounds, and I'm here ready to work the next section of branches. And so it's light, light, dark, light, 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 dark, light, 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 dark. And that's one thing about this pattern is once you get the stitch, I mean, because they're little, little bitty stitch counts with the, with the pattern, once you get that in your head, you don't have to keep referring to the chart. You can complete a round and then look at the chart when, um, after you've completed that round. So I'm holding the, I'm holding the light, this one was a light pink, yeah. I'm holding the light pink below. I need to knit a couple of stitches to get to the beginning of the round. And this is light, light, dark, and then three lights and a dark. And now I'm going to work a darker pink stitch. I want to make sure that these stitches, the pink one, or the, the stitches between um, the dark colors that I've knit, are not all bunched up. I want to make sure that they're nice and stretched out so that when I knit this stitch with the dark pink, there's a nice loose float on the back. If it's bunched up, it's going to show on the front of the work. You're not going to have great tension. Again, oh, actually, I, want, <laughs> I did it automatically. I need to explain it. Light, light, light. I put my needle in to knit with the darker stitch. I pull those stitches on the right needle to stretch them out so that when I knit that stitch, there's a nice loose float. Put my needle in, stretch it out, knit with the other color. Now there are lots of different ways you can hold the yarn that works for you. I'm gonna go 
into it a little bit how I do it. I kind of have both yarns in one hand um, and I flip this way when I want this color and I flip this way when I want this color. And I'll show you something you can do that is works just as well is to drop one color and when you're ready to work the other color drop that color and pick the other one up that works just as well you see the way that I stretch those stitches out each time that is totally automatic for me because you see all these mittens I've knit, I've had lots of practice with this. And you'll also notice what I've talked about. The, the light pink is below the dark pink. Kind of, people, I, I, I hesitate to use that word because people see it in different ways. They see, oh, it's behind, it's below. This one is kind of always this way, and this one's kind of always this way. Just find your groove and just stick with it and make sure you're keeping it that way all the time. So <clears throat> that's how I'm working Fair Isle. Finish this round, and then it's easy enough to see the next round is uh, li uh, light, dark, and then three lights, one dark, three lights, one dark, same thing again. And that's how that's gonna get the branch pattern. The next thing we're gonna talk about are carrying long floats. And there aren't very many sections in this pattern where this happens. But up in here, you'll see that there are seven dots together. And that's what we call a long float. There are seven dark color or contrasting color stitches together. And so that float on the back of the work is going to be very long. And that can be problematic, especially in mittens where you're putting your hand inside the mitten, your fingernail can catch in those long floats. The point is we don't want to leave seven stitches out there all by themselves. And that's called catching the float. And that's what I'm gonna to demonstrate to you now. I'm actually missing a stitch marker here. Let me get a stitch marker. Okay. So I am on this row, I'm actually on five. I'm on this row right here. And it starts with seven contrasting colors. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to handle that. So I'm gonna knit two, three, four. I'm gonna knit kind of halfway into that. And then I want to wind these two working yarns together a little bit to catch the float is what it's called. So I'm going to just kind of twist them together so that when I knit the next stitch, you see that pink, that lighter pink is caught up in the back of that stitch that I just knit. And that shortens the float. And that was five, six, seven, and now a lighter pink. And I'm gonna do it again. One, two, three, four. I'm just going to twist one strand over the other. Five, six, seven. And stretch those stitches out to do a lighter pink. And one more time. One, two, three, four, just wrap them together, five, six, seven. And that keeps the floats on the back short enough, short enough so that your fingers aren't going to get stuck in them when you put them in. I know that's especially important when you're knitting mittens for kids are trying to get mittens on babies because <laughs> their, their little bitty fingers get stuck in the in the floats. Also very handy for adult mittens. Okay, I think that is it for this section. Um, actually, let me pull out the longer chart again. 
Oh, no, 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 no. There's one more thing I want to talk about. Because on row, f I do want to pull this out. On row five of the hand part, you're going to start the thumb chart. And so on the right hand mitten, you're going to knit across the row or work across the row in the color pattern until you get to the marker you've placed. And then you're going to start the thumb chart. And let me pull that out. This is a blow up of the thumb chart. And so you just kind of put this section in right here. <laughs> so the first thing you're going to do is a make one stitch and you're going to have um, K KFB and make one. And so you'll increase to create the thumb gusset. It actually, it looks way more complicated than it is. You make one and uh, increase along the thumb gusset following the color pattern. And maybe this, because this is so high contrast. Yeah, that shows it pretty well. And then when you get to the stitch count listed in the pattern, you will stop knitting those and just put them on a piece of scrap yarn. And then for the left hand mitten, you will start the thumb chart at the beginning of the round so that the snowflake pattern ends up on the back of the hand. And those happen on round five of the mittens pattern. Once the thumb is done, you will just do follow the increases and then do the kitchener stitch at the top of the mitten to graft it together. And I will give you a link uh, in the video description field below and on my website to the kitchener stitch if you're not familiar with that. We use that a lot in, in sock toes. Okay, that's it for this section. In the next section, we're going to talk about actually working the thumb. Okay, so we've gotten through most of the mitt and what we have left is this naked thumb. So that's what we're going to cover next. Let's take a look. Okay, so we have our mittens finished and all seamed up at the top. Um, we're just missing the thumb. And I want to go through this part pretty carefully with you because I think it's probably the fiddliest part of the whole thing. Because up until now, we've been working the rounds and just incorporating the thumb gusset into everything else. And something I didn't mention in the last bit, we have the make one stitches on this side. Um, whenever a pattern just says make one and doesn't tell you which, uh, which make one to use either right or left, it's kind of knitter's choice. I used make one lefts here because a left leaning increase I thought would look the best. Also, I just like working make one left stitches. They're a little easier <laughs> than make one right stitches. So for this section to knit the thumb, um, you're going to need to use double pointed needles. Now I know I'm gonna get the question, can I use magic loop? Yes, of course you could use magic loop if you prefer it. I think it's easier on double pointed needles. And if you don't like double pointed needles, um, usually people don't like double pointed needles because they aren't very used to using them. So I encourage you to give them a try, get some practice with them because they do make things like little bits of knitting like this easier. I think it's kind of too cumbersome to have just a few stitches on magic loop. I think DPNs are easier. And I have used this cotton, it's kind of crochet thread, I think, for reserving the stitches. And I do that because it's so thin and it's not fuzzy at all and it makes it easy to get my needles um, into, the, into the stitch um, with the, uh, the crochet thread still there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take my DPN and starting here at the, the crook of the thumb, I'm gonna put 10 stitches on the first needle. Just following the thread through each stitch. So 10 stitches on that one. I'm gonna put 10 on the second one. And then 
there's just one stitch left, I'm going to put on the third one. And I'll tell you, sometimes the last stitch really gets tucked in there. If you can get a grip on both sides of the cord on either side of the stitch, and give it a tug, you can pull that stitch out and make it easier. And now I have all the stitches on there. I can cut this cord, and if nothing is snagged, it will pull right out. It did. If it snagged, I'd have to go back and find where it snagged and actually probably cut the red cord in a few places to make sure it just slid out. So I'm going to start knitting here at the base of the thumb, and I'm going to follow the fair isle pattern. And the first round is going to be the trickiest because we're going to pick up some stitches, and that's why I only have one stitch on that last needle. So we are here on uh, round 27, and we're going to follow the color pattern, and we get to the end. These symbols here are picked up stitches, and so I definitely want to get through this whole round with you. Um, for attaching the two yarns and, oh, this round is tricky. This is the trickiest round of the whole mitten because, well, you'll see. Okay, this round starts with, um, yes, two cream color stitches. And I'm going to leave myself a good tail, wrap the needle and pull it through. And then I have a dark stitch, so I'm going to put my needle in there, grab the brown yarn, or pine cone I think it's called, fold the yarn over, leaving myself a good tail, wrap that stitch. And now I have seven cream color stitches. And which means, you know, as we learned in the last section, that means that I need to catch the float. So as if there wasn't enough going on, right? three, four, and I'm going to catch that float. <laughs> Five, six, seven. Okay, first needle done. And that float's actually a little loose. I'm going to, I'm going to tighten that up just a tiny bit. Now moving to the next needle, I'm going to start with a brown stitch. This is really uh, an important part of knitting Fair Isle on double pointed needles. I think it's probably the trickiest part of Fair Isle on double pointed needles. Now my brown yarn is coming from here and I need to knit this stitch. But if I do that, it's going to string the yarn just straight from that angle, straight from there to there at that angle without really following the stitches around like we did in the rest of the mitten. So I'm going to catch the yarn again to catch it with this last stitch because from here to here is much more in line with the roundness that I'm trying to achieve here with the thumb, right? So I'm going to catch that yarn again I need to give it an extra twist. So if I just twisted it once, it wouldn't really catch. Well, let me take a look at this. If I twist it this way, it catches. Okay. I need to do one brown stitch here. Let me make sure. Yes. And then seven. Cream. But it's a long float, so I want to catch that stitch. And then a dark color stitch. I'm trying to maintain my pattern of color dominance. And then this last stitch is a cream color stitch. And 
and I'm going to catch that float again just because this part is uh, a little tricky here. Okay, let me get myself in a position so the camera can see what we have going on here. I'm at the crook of the thumb, right, right here. <clears throat> and there's a big gap here. And so I wanna pick up stitches. I wanna pick up stitches along here um, to fill that gap up. And I'm just thinking, because I, I did have one stitch on this other needle. I'm gonna keep that there on this needle. I didn't have to, I could have 11 on that needle, that's fine. I'm going to use the dark brown to pick up five stitches. Now this is, um, it ends up being a little bit of trial and error because you wanna see what looks right, what's gonna hold. So I'm going to go under two strands here. Pick up one, give it a tug, that looks good. Go under two strands, two, that looks good. Let me make one not look good. Three, when I give it a tug, that's pulling, it doesn't look right. Let that go. Three, nope, that's still not looking right. I'm gonna skip that spot, go over here. Three, that looks good. Four, I'll pick up the fifth, whoops, you know what I wanna do? I wanna catch that cream color yarn because that's a long stretch. Five, we did it! Okay, now we're in a position to just keep doing what we were doing before in working the chart, working the color chart and going around and around. It's just a smaller circumference circle than we were working when we were doing the, the, the whole mitt. And keeping in mind that if you are carrying a stitch from one needle to the other, or not carrying a stitch, carrying a color from one needle to the other, you want to have both colors pretty close to the end of the needle. You don't want to carry it from the last stitch here, kind of deep into that needle over here, or it's going to end up, you know, kind of crisscrossing the thumb when someone tries to put the, the mitten on. You want to um, have the yarn carried. You're going to do a lot of twisting to maintain the color pattern. And it's kind of, uh, it's good. It's interesting and good that the, the round where we had the the picked up stitches and getting everything on the double pointed needles that it was also around with long floats and so we had to catch those floats as well as everything else but now i'm just ready to go actually why don't i just go ahead and work around here my first stitch is uh light actually i'm going to catch that yarn again on this last stitch. I'm gonna, I'm glad I did this because I saw that it felt like it was stretching too far. So on this last picked up stitch, I'm going to twist. The yarns together and then pick that stitch up. Okay, that makes it easier. Just how I explained a moment ago. Let me see my color chart here. It's light, three darks. Light, light. Dark. Light, light, three darks. And because my cream color, I, my last two stitches are cream and brown, I don't have to catch any floats there. That's 
it's close to the end. Light, light, dark, light, light, three darks. I'm going to want to catch that. So my last two stitches of the round are of this needle are both colors. Light, light, dark, light, light. Um, okay, I'm not going to... Actually, I messed up the chart because I was supposed to start... I was supposed to start um, alternating the colors and not continuing the color pattern. So I, I could tink this out. You know what? I will. One, two, three, four. One. This is making it hard on yourself when you have to redo something because you weren't looking at the pattern. Okay, the last four colors are light, <laughs> dark, light, dark. Okay. You can see that round went a lot faster than the other ones. So with the, as far as the thumb chart goes, um, you only have a few rounds to work on the double pointed needles. It doesn't take very long at all. You can see after you get past that one row where you're picking up the stitches, it goes much easier. And then we have decreases for the top of the thumb and <clears throat> your stitch count is going to decrease, of course, it's going to be cut in half in this round and then cut in half again. Um, and oh, what am I trying to say? A lot of times in charts, the stitches where there, the boxes where there are no stitches, a lot of times they'll gray those out and it's called a no stitch because there's nothing there. In this one, it's just kind of a blank spot. It isn't even really a square anymore. So don't let that confuse you because we still, it still looks like you have all the boxes, but they're, they're not. There are no stitches there. You've cut the stitch number in half. And this just helps you space them out, space out the decreases um, uh, so they're all even. They're really just every other stitch. But you see how there are no lines here in the chart? That's because there are no stitches there. And you could take a pencil and gray them out, but just keep in mind there are no stitches there. I think that's it. And that is it, how to make the twilight mittens or all the techniques used. Be sure to check out the different colors on the Mountain Meadow Wool website. The kit is a great value. Many thanks again to Mountain Meadow Wool for letting us do this tutorial from the shutdown studio. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun making these and a lot of family members are going to get these in their Christmas stockings. I hope you enjoy the pattern. Good luck.